For anybody watching this that thinks in any way, shape, or form that I do makeup for the male gaze, clearly I don't. <laughs> Hi guys, what's up? It's Tahira. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello. Don't forget to click that subscribe button down below and join the fam. I make a lot of fun videos, including this video, which is coming at a time where I am un poquito overwhelmed because I'm in the middle of several life-changing events at the same time, but still giving you great, amazing, aesthetically pleasing content. See? So we're in a new setting. I've never filmed over here, I think. I'm not sitting on my couch or at my desk because I'm in the middle of moving out, which segues perfectly into what this video is about. Yes, girl, you read the title correctly, my boy. Your girl is leaving the country, inshallah. I'm moving. Mm-hmm. If we want to be technical, I'm moving twice because nothing in my life is ever simple. Right. <laughs> so this is a chit chat. Get ready with me all about my move, my current life, my mental stuff, how I'm feeling. We got to sprinkle, sprinkle <laughs> some God in there as always. You said, what are you bringing to the table? Men are tired. I'm not bringing nothing to the table, baby. Sprinkle, sprinkle. Actually, guys, over my Instagram, at Sincerely Tahiri to ask me any questions you had about this new step in my journey in my life but yeah this is perfect timing for me to talk about this because like i said i'm in the middle of packing up my apartment which i'm filming a separate moving vlog for that but also i want to give myself the proper space and time to emotionally process all the things going on in my body and my brain going on in my surroundings and i like working things out with y'all we're all very much connected in the circle of life yeah i was gonna drop a lion king reference because that's my movie and like why did y'all do Mufasa like that anyway so we're gonna do a book look i haven't done a book look in a very 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 long time but i've just finished family lore by elizabeth acevedo i don't think it's actually officially out yet i got sent an art and i read it i loved it i gave it four out of five stars and i really 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 love the cover i'm gonna put it on the screen i really want to work on my detailing with my graphic liner anyway i don't know how detailed i'll be in this video but let's get into it first i gotta bring y'all closer let me bring y'all in okay so i decided to do my brows off camera because we all know that's what takes the longest i also was watching an episode of good trouble oh girl they brought dro from insecure back mm. anyway also i'm sorry if the sound is a little bit weird i can't hold my phone and do my makeup so it's a little bit like out of camera first of all let me look at the cover of this book because i feel like i forgot what the book looks like some of my spirit is like yeah i'm gonna sit here and say that i'm gonna do this like really colorful eye and then i'm gonna do my base and be like oh Never mind. <laughs> Question number one is obviously, where am I moving to? I don't know if I said this already, like on camera, but I'm moving to Colombia. The country, not the city, not the school. Colombia. Every time I tell people I'm moving to Colombia, they're very confused and like low-key taken off guard, which makes sense. It sounds a bit random. So let me give you guys some context, some backstory. One of my favorite YouTubers ever is Kiana Naomi. I feel like it's really hard to find black girls that give you aesthetic vlog content, really personable, think like Emma Chamberlain, but black kiana naomi lived in colombia i want to say for like six months last year and i remember when she moved i was so just enthralled with it last year so many of my favorites on the internet became like digital nomads like he told me moved to paris and then she was in istanbul i know moya went to paris she went to italy she's now living in paris etc 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 i was like that's so amazing that's so dope but to be honest i never really considered myself a travel girly i didn't leave the country for the first time until november november i went to umrah i know i didn't like vlog it for youtube but that's because i was just like really present in the experience if you want to see more behind the scenes from me at umrah check out my instagram i have some like little mini vlogs posted also my tiktok at sincerely to hear you with two whys going to umrah literally changed my life it just opened my eyes in the most surreal way i've always said since i was in like high school that if i ever had children inshallah that i wouldn't want to raise them in the u.s for obvious reasons but leaving the u.s actually blew my mind and made me realize just how serious i was about that i truly just feel like the way we live in the u.s is not natural it goes against our fitra it makes everything a lot harder specifically when i came back from umrah i was now you know trying to keep that spiritual high going coming back home i realized the weight of how difficult it was to practice i was like this is not normal it's almost like there's interference in the connection between me and Allah and me and myself that's really just like throwing me for a loop and y'all know that I have been in therapy four years <sighs> Ooh, yeah. 
I've been in therapy for quite some time and there's a lot of self work that I naturally do. I'm somebody who is always trying to work on myself, um, always trying to improve X, Y, and Z. But then I just realized like, bro, it's not me. And y'all know that TikTok is like, are you depressed or do you just live in the US? Or like, are you depressed or do you just need a vacation? It's even deeper than that. I really just feel like, like I said earlier, the way we live here is just unnatural. During this last Ramadan, I was listening to like her on 30 for 30 that Yakin does. And one of the episodes they were talking about, I want to say it was Surah Nahal, the bee. So in Surah Nahal and in a lot of the surahs that are named after animals, Allah talks about the subtle, miracles that we see every day just in nature and like how those are signs for people who take heed who believe and Omar Sidi Man made a great point about how here in the west we're very disconnected to nature so the way that things naturally move and occur and specifically if you're in a city you're disconnected from parks from trees from water from fresh air if you're in a hood you're disconnected from real food you know you're in a food desert all of these things are crucial to I feel like our understandings as beings on earth created by a law to be disconnected from other creations of a law you just feel it you know what I mean y'all know I'm a little Sufi on the weekends so I think that's part of the things that I was feeling past just therapy past just my own traumas past even just like shaitan whispering and everything like that I truly just feel like there's a big disconnect with being here in America specifically so I came back home from Umar right and I was like girl what are we finna do about this now that you've experienced other ways of living are you gonna continue to live how you've been living and I also was thinking about my life in a more like existential way because I knew that my lease was coming up. I moved into this apartment June 10th, 2021. It's housed me, it's held me, it's comforted me, it's consoled me. It really was a place for me to just connect to myself. I keep saying that like living here, I was just like licking my wounds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like really just trying to heal and recover from all of the trauma that I went through in COVID specifically, but also just like in my life. If there's any bit of advice I can give you, if you are the eldest daughter, if you are in an immigrant family, any type of marginalized background, but especially if you are a black Muslim woman, you need to live on your own, specifically before you get married. Like there's just things that you learn about yourself that you need the time and the space to do so. There's parts of yourself that come into fruition when you're on your own that you can't really experience in other times. What does that look like? <laughs> Let me ask y'all like y'all for the answer. I was just feeling with all of these feelings, right? I'm like, okay, I can't stay in the US. My lease is coming up. And so many African-American women specifically have been leaving the country and specifically going to like Central America and South America, which we're gonna get into that a little bit later about what that looks like and gentrification and all of that but I was like bruh is this a calling also for people who don't know just like growing up in New York I was always exposed to people that spoke Spanish you know whether it's in the bodega whether it's at school whether it's anywhere and I feel like I've always had a natural affinity for Spanish because I just picked it up so well Espanol is mi idioma favorita porque a mi encanta como lo suena el ritmo el flow y también a mi encanta la cultura la gente la música obvio yeah like, I just I love it there's a certain flow to Spanish that feels very comfortable and natural for me. So before I ever decided to move to Colombia, I started learning Spanish. And this is another question. Somebody asked me, how did I start learning Spanish? I literally woke up one day and was like, Tahira, just teach yourself Spanish. Por que no? I'm literally still doing my brows. Hold on, hold on. I'm really trying to think if I want to do my um, eyeshadow. Damn. Oh, necesito encontrar como, como hacerlo, porque no sé. I'm just gonna move into my face and give myself more time to figure out what I wanna do with my eyes. One of the things that I've really been exploring while living on my own is just my love for education, but school has been very difficult for me to navigate just because I'm a black Muslim woman, I was a black Muslim girl, and I have a lot of trauma with teachers trying to like humble me, teachers threatening me, teachers messing up my grades, teachers like discriminating against me, but I've been self-teaching, like continuing my education just on my own whether that's through Islamic stuff whether it's through books and so I literally was just like I know I can teach myself Spanish I know it's gonna be something that is gonna be difficult but quiero hacerlo entonces I did it <laughs> well I did it is a very definitive statement no matter how natural Spanish sounds coming out of my mouth which I love when people give me that compliment 
because I also feel the same way. I am not fluent. I'm just really good at accents and accents make it kind of easy for me to like fake the funk in a lot of ways. As somebody who is a descendant of enslaved Africans, I did not choose to speak English. And yes, I'm 100% aware that Spanish is a European colonizer language, of course, but I'm not trying to learn how to Spanish speak. Have y'all heard like accents of people from Spain? It's nasty. Lo siento, perdóname. Pero no me gusta. Like, I don't like it. But there's just so much power that I felt and so much reclamation that I've experienced by choosing to speak another language. And if you listen to a lot of like polygots, they all have like their favorite language. And I just think there's something so powerful about being able to be like, yeah, this is the language that I was taught, but this is the one that feels like me. This is the one that feels like home. This is the one that makes me feel more like myself. I'm filming a video about how I've been teaching myself Spanish. So definitely stay on the lookout for that, but in a simple, simple way. Immersion. Immersion. As much as you can. It's not like I'm immersed physically or culturally in a place that is Latino, but I've immersed myself. The number one app that I recommend that I've been using is Language Transfer. I love Language Transfer. It's also a YouTube channel. They don't have like every language in the world, obvio, but they have like a good amount, like Spanish, German, Arabic, etc. So I've been doing language transfer. Películas y programas de televisión en español o programas de inglés, pero con subtitles in Spanish, if that was as correct as I think. Also, music has been really helpful, but specifically I'll hear a song and then I am listening to the song while looking up the lyrics that pop up. If you have Apple Music, you can just like press a button and it'll show you the lyrics as the song is playing. That's been super, super helpful. I also just went to Colombia. That vlog is probably already up. Even though I was only there for a week, I really feel like it helped me so much with learning because in the words of mi hermana Jessica, one of the sisters that I met when I was in Colombia was saying to me that when we learn our native languages, we don't just learn them in school. You know what I mean? Like we learn them with a mix of picking up the language of like our parents and the people around us. And then when you go to school, it kind of like organizes it in a really important way. And I guess this goes back to the first question about where I'm going and like why I'm going to Colombia. Overall, I'm going because I want to become more fluent in my Spanish. And like I said, I had that inspo from Kiana's experience of being there, but also with doing my own research about Colombia as a country, their history, I realized how perfect it was. Colombia was everything that I was looking for. I'm very, 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 very black. Right, we all know this, see? And so it was really important for me to be in a place that had a lot of black people, but also black history. And Colombia has so many black people. Colombia, I think actually has the second largest population of black people in the Americas outside of Brazil. There's a town in Colombia called Palenque, which I got to visit, alhamdulillah, which was the first town of free Africans in the Americas. And if you go to different places along the, the coast of the Caribe and places like Cartagena, which is where I was, and Cali, the black population is just very, 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 very prevalent. So I wanted to be in a place to have black people. Also, Colombia's vice president is a black woman, which I love. Another reason I chose Colombia was because I like their accents. And I feel like even more now since I've been, I got to experience the like Paisa, like Cali Uchis accent. Colombia has one of the easiest accents to understand. They kind of talk slow and like sluggish. Oh, I look so crazy right now. Just rock with me. Also, I got a tan. So none of my colors are like what they should be but that is okay. Cause watch me finesse this. Colombia is also a place that has a lot of people who don't speak English. When I was there, there were like a few people who can kind of understand me, but for the most part, I was playing translator between like my group 
and the locals, which is funny because I'm not fluent as y'all know, but I was doing my best. I was trying, child. Columbia is also pretty close. It was only like a five and a half hour, six hour plane ride. And that was when I was in Cartagena. I'm moving inshallah to Medellin, which is another vibe, another city. When I was in Cartagena, I was asking the people in the masjid and like the people that I met how they feel about Medellin because we're gonna get into this a little bit later. I had a lot of anxiety about this trip. For those who don't know, I decided to move to Colombia before I ever went to Colombia. This trip that I just went on really was kismet. Like a lot just dropped it out of nowhere and I really feel like it was for me to feel more comfortable with going. And everybody says it's the best part of Medellin. It's beautiful, the weather, the people are so nice. There's so many things to do, but most importantly, the Muslim community was a lot more prevalent. When I was in Cartagena, there was only one masjid, I believe, but apparently Medellin has like three or four masjids. They have halal restaurants, they have halal meat markets, like the muzzies is out there. So I said, oh yeah, love that for me. So these are just some of the things that I was like keeping in mind when I was choosing a place. And then I was just like praying about it. And it really just lined up. I was originally just gonna go by myself for like three months, right? <laughs> and then my stepsister, Hayat, she was like, bruh, I wanna go to Colombia. And I was like, are you sure? Like, you also wanna go to Colombia? Girls, so I'm going to Colombia. Inshallah, we will be going to Colombia the first week of July. As I film this, it's May 20, oh my God, my brother's birthday is next week. It's May 21st when I film this. Yeah, we're gonna be going together. My plan is to stay for six months. I told myself three months, but I don't feel like it's enough to be honest. So that's how Columbia came about. I'm sorry, that was like two, three questions into one. I forgot how to film this. That's the only thing about doing your makeup on camera. You feel like it's really cute and like it's not. Let's just blend these harsh edges. You see, like I know what I'm doing. I'm telling you, don't play with me. How did your family and friends react to you deciding to move overseas? This is actually very funny because my family and friends are very mm. dramatic. So I started dropping hints to my mom like when the year started, I feel like because we were just having conversations about like, okay, what am I gonna do when my apartment is up? Like, am I gonna resign my lease? Da, 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 da. And I just kind of already knew that I wasn't gonna sign it, but I'm like, okay, how do I bring up to my black mama that I'm trying to leave the country? Um, needless to say, she responded in a very black motherly way. She started talking about Pablo Escobar and she was like, Tahir, you need to watch Narcos. And it, <laughs> she was just being a black mom, right? And I remember in, that was that December? In December, we went to Virginia to visit my family that lives out there. And my mom brought up me wanting to go to Columbia. And like my grandmother was like, absolutely not. My uncle was like, you can't go nowhere by yourself. And I was just like, I'm grown, who gonna stop me? If I'm being so for real, like it was never a conversation of if I was going to go because I'm a woman that lives on her own, that takes care of herself. Nobody financially supports me. It was really just about wanting my mom specifically to feel more comfortable. The rest of my family will adjust, but like my mama is my mama. So I just was having conversations with her about Columbia and like sending her videos and stuff like that. But I think the thing that really won her over was me going. So like I said, this trip literally came out of nowhere. Shout out to Kiona. Kiona one day was like, oh, Tahira, me and my family and like some people from the masjid are going to Colombia for the last week of Ramadan. Do you want to come with? And I was like, huh? Why would y'all pick Colombia? Like really feeling like this is this is like meant to be. And I remember my mom literally said that she would feel so comfortable with me going to the country first and like having a bit of an experience there and specifically going with people who she knew, going with Muslims. And I think there was just like a understanding between us that if I would go during Ramadan, spending Eid there, you know, it's just like the blessed time and space that that is and still feeling comfortable, still feeling ready. If Allah was gonna bring certain things like money and opportunities my way for me to do it, then it's color of Allah. And I think that's the place that me and my mom are really at now. She told me the other day that um, she was talking to my grandmother about it, which like I said, I have no idea how the rest of my family feels about it, but they'll probably be just watching the vlogs with everybody else. But she said she was talking to my grandmother about it and she was telling her that she was just really excited for me in addition to the regular black mama anxiety. Because this wasn't something that she had an opportunity to do herself like my mom has never lived on her own my mom has traveled a little bit but she hasn't traveled like out of the country in years and you know it is just something really powerful like i keep saying to have the time to yourself to explore the world to find yourself and going back to why i'm going to columbia for a little bit i feel like people always have their little like eat pray love moment in white european 
places. And even though tourism has a lot of parts of it that are problematic and can hurt the countries, especially in the global south, I do feel like whatever benefits of tourism should go to these countries that are marginalized and have been oppressed by said global powers. Like, why would I ever bring my black Muslim behind a Paris? For what? When I can just go to a place that was colonized by, by France <laughs> and give them the support and love that they deserve. There's been a lot of conversations recently post pandemic about expats traveling and moving abroad specifically to the global south and even more specifically to central latin america and the caribbean now y'all know i'm a black woman from new york i am no stranger to gentrification and the last thing that i want to do is enact the same trauma and harm onto people that have enacted onto my people in my space and my communities i'm definitely open to hearing any advice that you guys have down below like practical ways to be an ethical traveler it's something that I've been researching and speaking to people there in Colombia and also friends of mine that travel a lot who have lived overseas about how to not bring colonizer mentality to these places and even though it gets a little bit complicated with the intersection that I have because my American identity really was never a thing until I left the country because you know being black you're not really American no matter how weird I feel about the American identity I have to acknowledge that that holds weight globally and the American dollar can change an entire neighborhood country so yeah these are all the things that I'm thinking about praying about and I don't think I have all the answers and I'm sure that I'm going to mess up but like I said before if you have any practical advice and tips on how to engage with a community how to be a part of a community how to support people in their local lands how to also go about sharing these things on social media because I also know that like a lot of influencers will go somewhere and be like oh my god it's so cheap here and completely dehumanize the place completely treated it like just a vacation ignore the fact that people actually live their lives there and that is home to people so yeah this is a rant but all i can say i guess is like give me grace but i also definitely want to travel in the most ethical responsible halal loving way that i can y'all understand what i'm saying right so i wanted to just be really intentional about that i would never really feel super whole super comfortable in a place that didn't have people that look like me and if they at least don't look like me you gotta at least be brown like what are we talking about my friends all alhamdulillah have traveled a lot all of my friends are older than me for the most part a few of my friends have actually been to colombia they've actually lived overseas for some time so they're actually the ones who are encouraging me to go they're like tahira you're the baby of the group you need to experience this and colombia is only the second country i've been to in my life I would say now everybody is on board. My family definitely is going to miss me a lot. My siblings are like having a time about it. But I will be spending the month of June in New York with my family. So I think that after that, they'll feel a bit more comfortable. And inshallah, after three months, I do plan on coming back to like visit people. For the most part, it's a lot of love and positivity. And I've been kind of dropping cookie crumbs with y'all like on my live streams about me moving. And I did have a lot of anxiety about bringing it up because evil eye, you know, Muslims love this whole like hard launch and like moving in silence thing. But I just feel like community is really powerful. And I had so much anxiety. I had like a lot of panic attacks about it. I was like, remember it was weeks of me crying. And some of the things that made me feel better was bringing it up to y'all and getting love and support from other people who affirmed me and were like bro this is what you should be doing my camera is dying i cannot promise what my makeup will look like when i get back but i'm gonna come back <laughs> never mind i'm actually back sooner than i thought because i had another battery pack because i'm an adult she's a content creator la proxima pregunta si ¿Sí? do you plan your move overseas to be temporary for the next five years or so like i said i only want to move for six months but the reason i'm kind of making this announcement about me moving out of the country is really what i'm doing is like preparing y'all <laughs> and everybody for my travel girl catching flights and like maybe feelings era i do see myself traveling often maybe every three or four months i do want to also study abroad that's another part i guess we could talk about this this is a little bit of everything and get ready with me something that happened when i came back from colombia i realized the way i live right now is no longer conducive for the person i want to be or the person I'm becoming. What I mean by that is, I've said this before like on Instagram, I feel like I have like a small case of COVID induced agoraphobia. And I don't think I ever really got over that. Yes, I did need to just like bunker down and be by myself, but I think also not having anywhere to go made it really hard for me to wanna go anywhere in the first place. Everything I would ever need to do is like in my house. And now that may sound crazy because y'all have seen me go back and forth to New York, but that's like for work, visiting family, X, Y, and Z. And that is 
is why it's been harder for me to be consistent on YouTube. I kind of went a little bit viral on TikTok and on Instagram. And so I've had a lot of new followers come to my page and there was somebody who scrolled all the way down to like my first ever post. And my initial response was to kind of be annoyed because like, girl, why are you looking down there? <laughs> so I went to go look to see what post that this person was liking. And I was just reading my captions and like specifically how far I've come over the past like the two years of doing this full time. And I just cried because like I really did this, like I really do this. Watching the likes go up, watching the engagement go up, watching the content quality increase, watching the brand deals and the partnerships do better. And even though, like I said, I'm not as consistent on YouTube as I want to be or as I used to be in the past, I was just like, Tahira, you never gave up. This is the same channel I've had since I was 12, when I was posting emo covers on the internet, singing into a microphone in my room. Room that I shared with my baby sister, I should say, because I didn't really have any friends and people always made fun of me and people always bullied me, but I was like, I just want to be heard. I just want to be myself. I just want a place to be me. Sincerely, Tahiri. And I'm like, bro, I never gave up. Even if y'all see new videos only twice a year, four times a year, once a month, whatever, I'm still here and I'm just really proud of myself for that. But I can also acknowledge how the pressure that came with this not just being my job because I want to specify yes there's a there's a conversation that people have about when your art becomes your work it gets difficult which I'm not going to say it hasn't been but it's a blessing for me to do what I love as a job like I wouldn't choose to do anything else right the difficulty comes from the fact that for the first time in my life this is all that I've done I'm a very multifaceted person. Y'all see that with my interests, but that's also in like how I live my life. And I think that's a part of me that has been disconnected because of COVID and then living here, like my own self-imposed quarantine the past two years. I was doing book looks, I was doing outfit pictures and I was reviewing books and taking all these aesthetic pictures. And like, I was just so much more active. And it was really because I had somewhere to go. I had things to do, places to be. And also life was influencing my art my creativity number one has saved my life full stop like that's the tweet and has carried me through so much trauma so much transition so much pain and hurt like i was looking at like my makeup looks and, like nobody could tell that i was like crying two hours before i put on my makeup but i know i was but two it was something that was entangled with my life this is the first time ever that i didn't have that like all i had all i was doing was just this and i think i was kind of like unplugged from the very things that inspired my art like what is art without going on a walk and seeing trees that inspire you to go paint what's art without being at a restaurant and being inspired by the noise and you go back and record a track like what's art without you know reading a book and it makes you want to do a makeup look inspired by the character or the cover art is intertwined with life and I think I wasn't really living a full life that I wanted to these past two years and I think that's because I just wasn't ready to but I feel ready now I've set a really firm foundation with my art and with myself I have my routines my self-care I have my practices I have my dean to really self-regulate but I feel like I'm ready to come back into the world like a butterfly is coming out of her cocoon and she's like hey what's good you know what I mean a tortoise coming out of its shell we're outside. This is not shade, but I've never been interested in the internet being my life. Social media is a tool for me to do what I want to do, but it is not who I am. It is just an avenue. It's a resource. It's a conduit, if you will. But social media is not it for me. Even though I love doing like my get ready with me to go to events and like my vlogging, and like behind the scenes of my photo shoots, that's great. But that is not the life I want to live. I do not want my social media to be my entire life. Like you look at some people and they're so disconnected from real life. What they call those like the terminally online people. I don't ever want to be that, you know? And there's just a certain amount of disconnectedness that happens when this is what you do for work. And it's funny because my favorite creators are the ones who are kind of disconnected from their audience in a certain type of way like I love chef shout out to chef love her I met her a few months ago a more than me be that right but I love how chef pops up every once in a while you don't know what country she's in she give you her little dumpy dumps she give you her little outfit posts and then she be gone I love best dress Ashley bro she ain't dropped a video in two years and you go on her Instagram she's in Paris I think right now she's in Korea 
and the content gives. I love that Bretman Rock literally lives in Hawaii on an island with chickens. With chickens. Like those are the people that I love because they have lives and they share that with the internet. That's what it's always been about for me. And so when I came back from Colombia, I was like, oh girl, we gotta, we gotta get back to living. Really what Colombia is gonna be for me is an opportunity to live again, to have a life. I'm super excited to have a routine of what I hope to be me going to school at least three, four times a week, if not every day, going to dance classes, going to cooking classes, exploring with my stepsister. And like, even that, like learning how to live with somebody to cohabitate with people. And I'm super excited for for the art that's gonna come from that because with me having somewhere to go to every day, obviously the fits are gonna give. Me speaking a new language is going to elevate my content and hopefully be more inclusive of people who speak Spanish. That's what the whole I'm moving out the country thing is. I'm just letting y'all know that we're entering a next stage, next chapter, next evolución de mi vida. What do I wanna do with this blue? How do you think this move will impact your career? I just answered that. Um, ooh, another part I will say is to be an influencer and really just to live in this world, you are a unfortunately connected to and a product of capitalism i never ever want to be that influencer y'all know i don't sit here and really talk about products i don't really like trying to sell y'all anything that's not my thing and i do think that being physically removed from not just new york which is a powerhouse in the industry but also like the continent and the country of america is really going to challenge that belief that i say that i have because i do plan on just being like more active on youtube and i know that i'm still gonna have to obviously like do brand deals but i would love to to be in a place where I don't have to like rely on that. I don't really know what that looks like monetarily, but I'm excited to see how being focused on storytelling and connecting elevates my content and being away from the US and the capitalistic aspects of influencing. Like I'm just really excited to see what that's gonna be like. I have no idea what I'm doing. I saw the like yellow and I wanna do like little flowers. Is that possible? I mean, por que no? How do you ease your anxiety? <laughs> that's it. That's a beautiful, brilliant, amazing question. I'll get back to you in like three business days. <laughs> no, um, on a spiritual sense, anxiety, at least for me, is me trying to overset my boundaries as a creation of a law. Me stressing about what I can and can't do, what I'm capable of, what the future's gonna hold, what I'm gonna do about this, da 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 da. A law knows everything. A law is in control of everything. A law created everything, not me. So he thought how he did a video on Instagram and he was saying something very similar. He was like, the future belongs to a law, it's not mine. And so from a spiritual sense, the way that I've managed my anxiety is just by letting go. That was actually my number one Ramadan goal. Like the girls were talking about be delusional, but like I dead ass were trying to have like no thoughts, just vibes in my head. And by submitting and surrendering in that way, I was so much more aware of Allah's signs and him communicating with me. Like I just, I got it. I understood it because I let go and let God, like literally. So that's been really helpful. In regards to like, I guess, spiritual practices, if that's also what you're asking about. I make the joke that like, I'm like Sufi on the weekends, but I I've definitely always been a spiritual person. So I'm like a bit more in tuned with the ways that that spirituality comes out in Islam through dhikr, through recitation, being more connected with nature. I feel like I've talked about this before, but when I make salah, I listen to like ocean waves and like rain and other natural things. And even if you look on YouTube, there's channels that have Quran recitation with like rain in the background. Those are really great for me, easing my anxiety. The repetition of dhikr is really, really powerful. <laughs> I've said it a million times for my brain as somebody who also has ADHD. You know, you think about like the techniques they teach you in therapy, like grounding, also like just coming back into your body, remembering who you are, tapping into your senses. And Dicker really, really does that for me. There's this idea sometimes that you have to heal and figure, like cure yourself, but to be human is to feel. I struggle a lot with intellectualizing my emotions. So sometimes I just let myself feel anxious. And then I tell myself, girl, what are we really anxious about? Like, don't Allah got it? Don't Allah got you? Aren't you smart? Won't you figure it out? Haven't you always figured it out? And I'm like, ooh, brain, you right, girl. Let's do the outside first. Mm -hmm. I feel like that would be easy. Why is that actually kind of cute? And the one technique they say when you're like being really hard on yourself is imagining you're talking to your inner child. And so I do think about baby Tahira and I'm like, what would you tell her? What would you say to her? 
talk to you like you would talk to her works all the time would you say is there something you need to improve on when it comes to modesty oh of course absolutely i remember i told you i was just looking through my instagram and one thing i had to give myself credit for is i've come such a long way and being on the internet people make you feel like especially as a hijabi that you're doomed for hell if you don't cover in a way that people feel like is acceptable everything comes with time i've noticed back then i was less stressed about what i looked like and it's funny to see how i've naturally just grown just naturally like found myself gravitating towards being more modest you know and i just am understanding more and addressing my own struggles with uh, modesty it has become a lot harder now that i realize that i am a body i truly am so it's a bit harder to cover because like you know that and you're just like wow i want y'all to know that too like do we see do y'all do you see <laughs> but some of my modesty goals is this may sound crazy but the girls who get it get it it's actually kind of hard for me to wear dresses and skirts i would say dresses specifically because i don't feel very modest in them because of the way my body is set up y'all know i don't wear skinny jeans but in pants like my cargoes my wide leg pants or whatever i feel very secure you know in a hoodie i feel very covered up in a dress in an abaya in a jilbab it's literally just like dresses and garments and like skirts are inherently very feminine so there's something about being a woman who is curvy and wearing them even just how you walk how you move it's just very sexy like i don't know what else to say i'm having a hard time coming to terms with that because another thing i want to not do as much as like layer a lot in the summer because that just makes hijab a lot harder but i feel like i can't just throw on a dress the way the girls throw on dresses even though i know that if i throw on a dress and it's loose and my body still pokes out that don't have nothing to do with me the internet will make you feel like you're you're the whore of babylon <laughs> because you have boobs so that's something i'm definitely trying to figure out let's do this again on the inner corner but we're going to make it a lot smaller Ooh, this is so messy oh my god i always feel bad for this eye because it's always the eye that i experiment with <laughs> and then watch this eye come out immaculate i'll come back when i finish the other eye I don't want to zoom in on the eyes because I'm not in love with how this came out. But this is the season of me really practicing what I preach in regards to perfectionism and letting go of the fact that I don't have to show up perfect to show up at all. And it takes a lot of courage to show up imperfect, especially on the internet. But here I am. What was the last thing I was talking about? Oh, modesty. People act really stupid about what they perceive as the correct form of hijab. But yeah, I think modesty in general is a journey and I am just really proud of myself how far I've come. And I'm really excited to see how that evolves in whatever ways it does. If you are like me and being a full-time girl that wears an araya is not the life that you wanna live, that's okay. There's so many other ways to be modest and to wear hijab that doesn't include an araya. And I'm gonna leave that there. Las chicas que lo entienden. Lo entiende. Speaking of hijab, this is a good question. What has been the most revolutionary thing that you've learned in your hijab journey? Let's say the most revolutionary thing that I've learned is that you cannot run away from being beautiful as a woman. I personally don't believe that interpretation of hijab as something that hides your beauty because I think women innately are beautiful. Like I think even if you can't see a woman's face, she's beautiful. I think niqabs are beautiful. I think abayas, that's a lie. Let's <laughs> me the girls are gonna think I really hate Abayas and that's not the point. I just don't like people forcing anything on me. So the more that people try to say that you can only wear an Abaya to be modest, the more I'm gonna like shit on Abayas. But women in general are beautiful and there's nothing you can do to separate the two. And Allah doesn't shame us for being beautiful. Allah doesn't punish us for being beautiful and Islam is upon the middle path. And so it's not about not being beautiful. If your goal is to look unattractive, you're never gonna accomplish it. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to break it to you. When you have that belief, you're putting somebody else's attraction into your hands and in your mind as if it's yours the man them are specifically gunning after hijabi they are attracted to hijabis they are attracted to the idea that we cover our bodies they feel like it's an allure a mystery you know Mia Khalifa is going to jail for that I'm telling y'all right now but anyway I'm specifically talking about like non-muslims in a fetishizing way but in general Muslim men are they not still attracted to hijabi women that they're married to or that they're getting to know so it's like you'll never not be attracted that's not the point hijab really if I had to summarize 
categorize what it is. It's about gatekeeping and privatizing your body and specifically like your sexuality, I would say is, is the best word to describe that. And I think sometimes because we learn Islam and we're taught Islam from men's point of view, they say things and they teach us about things in a way that really don't hit for us and that doesn't resonate because it's not fully correct. And I definitely feel a lot more free when I let go of the idea that, that I'm supposed to be ugly, that I'm supposed to seek being less attractive. I personally just don't believe that's what hijab is about. I think of course there's an aspect of it where not even just hijab, but if everybody in society is dressing how they should, men included, there's a certain level of like protecting each other from fitna that naturally like occurs, right? Deeper than that, if I would say modesty or specifically veiling or like covering your head, depending on what we're talking about, is something that is so intimate and has so much to do with Allah. And I just hate how some people really try to act like it's all about men and that's why like i refuse to even entertain those conversations because you're not going to put your responsibility to lower your gaze on me men are literally like punishing women for being beautiful i'm so sorry that god made me cute is Allah not al -Jamin? Is he not the, the most beautiful, the creator of beauty? I won't apologize for being beautiful. I will not apologize for even my body. It's so funny because literally like in the Quran, the two reasons for clothing is to protect yourself and like guard your privates and to adorn yourself. So yeah, I would say that's the most revolutionary thing. Somebody was asking me about Muslim friends and I wanna talk about this because I had another video that kind of went viral about what it's like being on a hijabi's close friends. I have to break it to y'all, but if you have the privilege, la bendicion, to be on a hijabi's close friends story, babe, you can't ever just scroll. She's trying to show y'all her latest skim set. She's showing y'all her knotless box braids that are 35 inches that touch the back of her knees. And you thought you could what, just tap away? You have a job. Who else is gonna compliment her on her harami mommy dress that she just got from Fashion Nova for the old girl party that's happening next week? The girls are starved for attention, affection. Don't even get me started on compliments. I'm so sorry, babes. Pokemon, I choose you. Okay, the weight of the world is on your shoulders to make sure that I know I'm as much as a baddie underneath this scarf that I am when it's on top. At me. And girl, no, them little hearts don't count. And so many people, even my followers are like, I don't feel comfortable doing that. What if they screenshot it? What if they send it out? And my first response is like, who are y'all friends with? No, like literally who are y'all befriending that you're scared to post a picture of your new blowout because you think she's gonna screenshot it and send it around? Like. Now I'm not saying Muslims can't be bad people because of course they can. I went through some friend breakups. It's so funny, last year it was when I went to LA for the first time and I went to visit some friends. I was even staying in one of my friends' house. And here we are a year later and I don't speak to either of those girls that I went to go visit anymore, right? And these are both black Muslim women. And even though the way the friendship ended was very, very, very shady, very fugazi, very ridiculous, I would never share pictures of them uncovered. First of all, like literally who does that? But two, like I fear Allah. You don't have to treat somebody like a good person because you like them. You treat people like good people because Allah commanded us to. It is def definitely more difficult navigating friendship breakups and friendships when you're Muslim because you would just hope that we all have the same ethic, but we don't. Like they say with well, relationships, you have to find people that have the same halal haram ratio as you. You have to find people who are truly on the same journey as you. I would be cautious about befriending people or even marrying somebody who's too far ahead in their journey. Cause yes, you can like admire them and look up to them, but there's a certain amount of like judgment and miscommunication that's naturally gonna be in that relationship because y'all are not in the same place. Y'all can have the same halal haram ratio, but still they can be better than you in certain circumstances. I have friends who are better at dua than me. I have friends who are more diligent with their prayers than I am. I have friends who cover more than I do. Even though we're so friends and we are compatible and whatever, there's things that they do that I aspire to and I would hope like vice versa that I can be an inspiration for my friends. Yeah, I don't think that creating friendship is any different than finding a spouse or like a partner or choosing a career. It's really just about like being smart. It's about thinking about what you need. It's thinking about how somebody can add to your evolution and make you a better person. And ultimately, you know, there is some people that you just don't mess with. Like I think it's a hadith about how Allah says there's people that that we knew from the spiritual realm and our souls recognize each other in this world, naturally the opposite would be true as well, right? Like there's people that you just are never meant to be friends with. <laughs> You're never gonna get along with them. But one thing I have been working on is something I really do 
need to get better at is just like adab in regards to interacting with people because even if people don't respect the fact that I am a Muslim and that I'm a person and that I'm a woman or whatever, if I say that I'm a Muslim, if I say that, you know, I follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I say that I believe in Allah and his messenger, then I have to hold myself to a certain standard even if other people don't. And I do feel like naturally people around you are mirrors to you. You know, like we know that even in Islam, you're on the dean of your friends or your companions. So if you are around people that act in a certain type of way, you have to either change that environment or change something within yourself and your environment will naturally change with that. How do you separate your self-worth from material things or level of productivity? Oh girl, don't drag me, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Whenever I get an answer, I'm gonna let y'all know. That's really, really, really hard for me because I grew up in an environment where I wouldn't say that I felt like I had unconditional love. So I felt like I had to perform to be considered a good child, to be considered a good student. And people made me feel like I was naturally a bad person. So I definitely have a people pleasing gene. And now as I like work for myself, that translates into the whole productivity curse, I would say. In the words of Village Auntie, and I have a video about this on my Instagram, you have to be focused on Allah-centered self-love and self-worth. Allah made you innately worth it and valuable just because you exist, just because you're breathing. And so when you go back to that as like your base level and also like removing the noise of people in the world and instead make it a lost voice, if that makes sense. Like for me as somebody that has a lot of anxiety, I'm constantly thinking about what other people are gonna say and what would be more productive for me is to think about what a lot would say. I don't think it's in general a bad thing for yourself first to be tied to what you do. At least for me, that's why I document my life and that has been really helpful for me reminding myself that I'm that girl and, some, and you need that but it's human to make mistakes, to mess up, to not be consistent, to not be productive. And I think really what the issue is, we see productivity as one thing and not a spectrum, if that makes sense. Sometimes you have all the strength and energy and mental fortitude, to do 30 things on your to-do list. And sometimes you just manage to wake up, take a shower, make yourself some food and makes a lot. And maybe not even all of that. And so who's to say that wasn't productive? You are keeping yourself alive <laughs> that is something to always be proud of. Like one thing I've done is I've tweaked my expectation based off of what I can really give at that time or at that day. And literally sometimes by the hour, I'm asking myself, Tahira, what can you do? What can you actually show up for? And it's really like capitalism. I hate to be the girl, but it's really capitalism that makes us feel like there's something wrong with us for wanting to rest and making us feel like all we are is based off of like achievements. I guess I would say like the biggest advice I can give is invest in your character in your actual personhood. Because that way, no matter what people take away from you or no matter what you're given, you're solid as a person. If you didn't have the degrees that you had, if you didn't have the grades that you had, if you didn't have the body that you had or whatever, like what would still remain? And it's really your character and your iman. It's who you are, how you treat people, how you move throughout the world and your relationship with Allah. Those are the things that if you invest in will never fail you, never do you wrong. You know, when people do makeup videos, they then like change after they finish their face. But I don't really know if I'm finna do that. I'm really comfortable with my body right now. I will not lie to you. What inspired you to get into makeup? Makeup really helped me learn to love myself. As cliche as it sounds, really because I was able to see that I was a canvas, that I was art, that my face was worthy of creating art with. A lot of black girls, a lot of marginalized people struggle with feeling ugly feeling not desirable and by doing something like this i was able to appreciate my features in a certain type of way i was somebody who when i was like in like middle school and like early high school it was really hard for me to look in a mirror because i thought it was that ugly so doing makeup you're literally forced to look at yourself the fact that like you have to sit there for hours sometimes and look at your face at least for me when i do makeup like make peace with the discoloration make peace with the pimples make peace with the dark marks make peace with the bags under your eyes make peace with your nose with your lips like like, that's what makeup taught me to do, to just see myself. I am aware that I probably look a little funny, but for anybody watching this that thinks in any way, shape, or form that I do makeup for the male gaze, clearly I don't, okay? I don't dislike this. This is a different type of look for me, obviously. Yeah, I feel like this is actually kind of like camp talk more about your process of trusting Allah's plan for you. I feel like we've kind of been talking about that a little bit this entire time. Ultimately, you don't know more than Allah. Allah knows you better than you know yourself. Allah's in control. 
Allah knows everything. You're not gonna do anything that's gonna surprise Allah. Like I said earlier when I was talking about anxiety, just letting go of this idea that I had to figure it all out or do X, Y, and Z, or specifically for me, the idea that I can smart myself out of situations, which sometimes you can't. Like, you know, obviously as Muslims, we believe that you tie your camel, you have free will. But I have to know and trust that even when I mess up, Allah got me, Allah will catch me, Allah will rectify me, Allah will keep me on the straight path. I think because I've just been in a position in my life where the people that you would think are supposed to be there for you and like you're supposed to like trust and love and or supposed to love and trust you have like abandoned me, I was truly just left with Allah. Allah made it very clear to me that I had no one if I didn't have him. My relationship with Allah is something that I've cultivated. It's something that I am working on. It's a constant thing and one of my biggest things is learning to trust a lot and like to be more comfortable with like letting him do his thing while I do <laughs> my thing. But like I truly talk to a lot like my best friend. And I think dua is really the way to for you to learn to trust a lot because at least for me, every dua I've made, I've asked for, I've gotten or received an answer to. You know, whether that answer was yes or whether that answer was not right now or whether the answer was no, I'm gonna give you something better. All of my duas have been answered. But to know if your dua has been answered, you have to be in tune with Allah. You have to know what Allah is speaking to you. I think people are often telling people like, go make dua, go make istikhara, go make tahajjud. But Islam and like religion, spirituality is very personal. So like, how does Allah show up for you? Allah knows that he made me very dramatic and over analytical, a hyper thinker, ADHD person, right? So Allah knows that like, I look at every little thing like a sign. And so when Allah is trying to tell me something, he will make every little thing a sign. Like I don't believe in coincidences. Allah knows that. He know he gave me three things in a row that look like X, Y, and Z. I'm about to be like, you got it Allah. <laughs> you got it. So you just have to like know like yourself to really know Allah. To know him, you have to know his names, his attributes. Learning the 99 names of Allah is really, 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 really helpful. I took a course on this and I know a lot of them, but I feel like I confuse the meanings with each other. But they're somewhere in my head. <laughs> Dua Kunut is really helpful to like learn the 99 names. I love listening to that. My mom used to play it all the time and now I'm in my own house blasting it. Knowing that Allah is al Latif. A lot is like subtle. Knowing that a lot is Al Alim, a lot knows all. Knowing that a lot is a Shakur, the most gracious, you know. I can think of like five or six names of a lot that all relate to his mercy. Knowing that a lot is Al Wadu, a lot is the loving, a lot is love. A lot is Al Nur, the, the light, a lot is As Salam, a lot is peace. At least for me, I'm able to know and be more in tune with how his attributes show up in my life because I know him. Or I like to say that I'm at least a little bit familiar. But I wanna say for the people that was like asking me about like insecurities, about anxiety, about self-worth, like all of that, something that really has been shaking me to my core is ingratitude. Omar Suleiman said in one of his Ramadan series that this dean is like half patience and half gratitude. And I was thinking about like, oh, I wouldn't say I'm an ungracious person, but I think about how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Aisha asked him, why do you like pray so much? You're Rasulullah. What you really need to be praying for? He was like, should I not be a grateful servant? Doing what Allah asked me to do is how I show my gratitude, but also celebrating the things that you've done the things that you've been given, the blessings that you have is how you show gratitude. So it really challenged me to like get my mind together when it comes to insecurities. To an extent, <laughs> it's ungrateful. When you're sitting there in the mirror poking at your face or your your features, your body, da da da, it's a sign of ingratitude, whether you realize it or not. And Allah, when he feels like you're being ungrateful, will remove even more from you to bring you closer to him. And so a part of my self-love, self-worth journey has been acknowledging that like I can't really be trash if Allah gave me what he gave me the hardest thing for me is to really like big up myself but when you meet me that's probably the first thing you'll feel and experience from me and it's not like arrogance I promise you it's not I am only that girl by permission and by way and by will of Allah and so I owe it to the Lord Al Khalik who is the creator Al Musawwir the fashioner to come in with the best content that I can give, to come in dressed to the nines. I need to carry myself as a creation of Allah. That has been oozing into my confidence as a way for me to show gratitude for the things that Allah has given me. Because when we nitpick, when we give into what capitalism or white supremacy tells us is wrong with us, we're missing what Allah says is great about us. I feel like that was a bar, that was a line, that was a tweet.
I hate that. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been very fun, very interesting. I'm allowing myself to become more comfortable with just talking to the camera and treating my YouTube as just like a diary. Please leave me duas and only sweet, beautiful things in the comments. <laughs> Definitely keep me in your prayers because this is gonna be a journey. This is something very new. I still have a little bit of anxiety about it, but I'm super, 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 super excited. I'm excited to take you guys along with me. I hope that this inspired you. I hope that this helped you. I hope that this made you feel better. This makeup look was is muy interesante, pero estoy muy odioso de mí. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure you follow me everywhere on the internet at Sincerely Tahiri. Like, comment, and subscribe, all the things, and I will see you in my next video. Inshallah. Ojalá. Bye.